Well, as we preach <clears throat> through the Bible, um, we've been examining this first letter that Peter wrote, and so I invite you to turn there, 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll continue on, and a common topic here in this letter has been undeserved, unjust suffering. Peter's been talking about that as he wrote this letter to the scattered church. And in chapter 3, there's a section that deals with it, but <clears throat> we've arrived at a portion here, um, beginning at verse 18. <clears throat> He says, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Well, we have a portion right here that's difficult to understand. It's always been that way. In fact, some of the commentators that I've read said this is the most difficult to understand in all the New Testament. But before we get to that difficult section, we have a very important, but thankfully easy to understand portion. And I'm really glad that the gospel is not hard. It's not difficult. People don't, they don't refuse to believe because the gospel's hard to understand. They refuse to believe because their heart, their heart is hard. But here is this portion, uh, this theme being continued of undeserved suffering, suffering for doing right, and Peter's putting out Jesus' example of one that suffered, uh, and he suffered to the point of death on the cross. So let's look at this verse 18 first before we look at the other two verses that I read. The first thing that I want to point out is these words, Christ also died. You might have a King James Version that says Christ also suffered. So the suffering is being highlighted here. Suffering to the point of death. He died. And the suffering was real. And um, I might acknowledge in passing right here um, something that would not be difficult for this group to believe and understand that Christ died, he actually died. But there are some who want to explain away the resurrection by saying, well, obviously, he wasn't dead when they took him down from the cross. They say, well, he just fainted, he swooned away, he passed out because of the pain, and this is how they explain away the resurrection. That's how he was able to come out from the tomb because he wasn't actually dead. But the, vibe, the Bible says plainly, he died. The soldiers came along to break the legs of the two thieves that were hanging with him to hasten their death. But in Christ's case, that was not the reality. A soldier thrust a spear into his side to verify his death. He died. He actually died. But what is proclaimed here in this verse is the reason. He died for sins. Jesus the sacrifice is highlighted right here. The reason he had to die was for sin. Sin necessitated his suffering and his death. He had to die for sins, remember the words that he said to the two that were on the road to Emmaus? Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things? 
It was necessary for sin. He died as a sacrifice. Isaiah 53, that marvelous prophecy concerning his death, he was pierced through for our transgressions, sin. He was crushed for our iniquity, sacrifice. The chastening of our well-being fell on him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. That's a problem. All of you are like sheep. You've gone astray. And Isaiah 53 says, each of us has turned to his own way. That was my problem. I was living life for me. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. That screams sacrifice. Not martyr, sacrifice. And Peter, earlier on in this letter, in chapter 2 and verse 24, says he himself, Christ Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross. Sacrifice. Personally, willingly, sacrificially, he died. He bore our sins on the cross. Now, there are some in the Bible days, the days of Jesus' walk on this earth, who followed him for various reasons, and they're the same today. Some followed Jesus because they were looking for a revolutionary. Remember that portion where it says Jesus was aware that they were going to come and by force make him king? Remember that? They followed him because they wanted a revolutionary. They wanted someone to set them free from Rome and the oppression of the Romans. And in fact, that idea of him being a king, that was all, that surrounded his death. You remember? Pilate said, are you a king? Jesus said, yes, but my kingdom is not of this world. Oh, so you are a king. And the accusation was he made himself out to be a king. And the sign above him on the cross, the king of the Jews, the Jews protested. They said, we don't have any king except Caesar. You see, they wanted a revolutionary, and when he wasn't that, it was crucify him. It's the same today. It's been the same all throughout history. People want Jesus, the revolutionary, the crusades. Let's go. Let's conquer the world. Let's defeat Islam and Jerusalem and in the name of Catholic Christendom. They want Jesus the revolutionary. And it's the same today. I pray for our country. I want Jesus to turn our country around. I do want that. But I don't want Jesus the revolutionary to do that. I want Jesus the sacrifice to do that. Because when people turn to Christ Jesus the sacrifice, they think differently. And the problems that are representative of problems in our country are changed because Christ changes the heart. Jesus the sacrifice, but not Jesus the revolutionary. There were ones that followed him because he was a miracle worker. They said to him, what sign do you do that we may believe in you? Show us a miracle and we'll believe you. What work do you perform? We're told the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he did in Jerusalem. Come here, do the same thing. Work a miracle. Herod was glad when they brought Jesus under arrest to see him because he was hoping to see some miracle. And many today, in the same way, they pray for a miracle. There's a dreadful disease. Pray for a miracle. There are people that never, they never pray. They never want to serve or walk with the Lord Jesus at all until there's some dire emergency, and then it's pray for a miracle. They want Jesus the miracle worker. Somebody that can fix their problems. There's the humanitarian Jesus. Jesus said, you seek me because you ate of the loaves and were filled. They follow him for what they can get. That's what the prosperity gospel is. 
people following Jesus for what they can get. There were those that followed him because he was a religious figure of importance. They said, this is the prophet. And it's the same today. There are those that follow, they follow a Christ who is nothing more to them than a religious figurehead. Superstitious religion. Vague. Worldwide Christendom. There were those that followed him because he was a public speaker. The Jews said, how has this man become learned, never having been educated? And when those Officers of the temple were sent to arrest him. The question was, why didn't you bring him back? And they said, no man ever talked like this man. There's Jesus the speaker. But he's not a revolutionary. He's not a miracle worker. He's not a humanitarian. He didn't come to this world for those reasons at all. He's not a religious figurehead or a good public speaker. Some say, oh, Jesus was just a good teacher. But if you examine the things that he said, you've come, you have to come to this conclusion. Either he was a liar, he knew those things were not true about him, he didn't come from heaven, and he was lying, or he was delusional, a lunatic. He thought those things were really true. You wouldn't call that a good speaker. He didn't come for those reasons. He came to be a sacrifice a sacrifice for sins. And the text, our verse right here says, once for all. That's once for all time, never to be repeated. Completely satisfactory in the eyes of God, a total success. The death of Christ on the cross. Hebrews says, he would have to offer himself often if that wasn't the case. Like the high priest that goes in year by year with blood that's not his own. That tells me in one century's time, at least a hundred times, a high priest went into the Holy of Holies to offer a sacrifice. The Jews knew all about perpetual sacrifices. But here is one who offered himself, his own blood. One time was all that was necessary. It was totally satisfactory. Hebrews went on to say, otherwise he would, Christ would have to offer himself often since the foundation of the world. But now once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been, man, been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Christ has been offered once to bear the sins of many. There's nothing more to be done Nothing more to be added. You talk about justice. Here's justice in this verse. Peter's been writing about suffering, undeserved suffering. Well, here Jesus is put forward as the example of undeserved suffering. Um, humanly speaking, there's never been a greater case of social injustice than the cross of Christ. Here is one who's perfectly innocent. The word is just. He's, unjust. He's just, dying for the unjust. And if Jesus is viewed in any other way than a substitutionary sacrifice, then his cross is nothing but a shame. What a shame that he was put to death. What an injustice. But this is the justice of God on display here. This is the just, the only just, the only innocent, the perfect man sacrificed for unjust people, you and me. It's substitution. He was delivered over because of our transgressions, Romans 4. While we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and I. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you or I were affixed to the cross, we wouldn't be any more different than those two criminals that were crucified with Christ. We would be dying and suffering 
and paying for what we had coming. That's civil justice. But with Jesus, it was no earthly execution in the eyes of God. It was a sacrifice. The whole thing was a substitutionary sacrifice. Deliberate, the just for the unjust. And then we're told the reason for it, to bring us to God. All of that to bring us to God. That was his mission. His mission was a rescue mission for sinners. Paul told Timothy, Christ came into the world, came into the world. He penetrated the world to save sinners. God in his love, in my case, and in many of your cases, God in his love said, bring him to me. He died to bring us to God. So when Christ died, he brought me to God. He was the sacrifice that eliminated my sins, that allowed me to approach God and say, forgive me, I've sinned. And I'm brought to God. He died to bring us to God. The believing thief on the cross next to Jesus, a transaction happened there and he was brought to God. His whole life lived in violent, pursuing violent crime, and in the end he was brought to God. Why? How could that ever happen? Because the justice of God was satisfied right there in the death of Christ. Today you'll be with me in paradise, he said. So if you believe in Jesus as a sacrifice, you'll never be disappointed. If our nation sinks, God forbid it continues on a downward course. If our nation sinks and you believe in Jesus as a revolutionary, you'll be disappointed. If that prayed for a miracle never happens, you'll be disappointed if all Jesus is to you is a miracle worker. And on and on it goes. World hunger and poverty and social injustice, those things are going to be with us till the end of time in a fallen world. If Jesus is a humanitarian to you, then you're going to be disappointed in all of that, but you'll never be disappointed if to you Christ is a sacrifice. Because then if all of those things continue on and happen, in the, in the end, you die and you're brought to God because that was his whole mission, to bring us to God. He accomplished redemption there. He bridged that gap of alienation between me and God. He removed the offense and reconciled the offended one and made the way clear so that the offender could ask forgiveness and be restored, forgiven. He's the one mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy 2.5, the man Christ Jesus. Paul told the Ephesian church in chapter 2 and verse 16 that he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by having put to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away. He is the peacemaker between God and man. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, on my deathbed, I'm not going to, if I happen in the grace of God to have lucid thoughts when I'm dying on my deathbed, I'm not going to be laying there saying, you know, I really wish I would have fought more for liberty and social justice. I wish I would have done more to help poverty and all of these things. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, I wish I loved God more. I wish I knew Christ more. I wish I walked closer to Him. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near. He died to bring us to God. 
He died in the obedience to the will of a loving father. It was God's desire, God's plan, God's love that motivated him to send Christ. Sometimes we have this view that God is the ogre and he's sitting up, he's sitting up there on the throne ready to throw people into hell and Jesus came along, the good guy, and made a way so that we could, that wouldn't happen to us, but it wasn't that at all. It was the justice of God. He sent his son because he loved us to bring us to him. The death of the just one for the unjust. God was the peacemaker. He so loved the world, he gave his only son. To the Colossian church, I love the way that Paul writes these letters to this church, to that church, and he says so many, so many times the same thing and just in a different way. He says, God, through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind and engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. I'm very grateful that Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. It was the will of God that he go to the cross. There was no other way. He said, if there's any other way. But there wasn't. Now, at the end of verse 18, we have a contrast here, and the contrast is between two realms. It says, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. He died in the physical realm was raised in the spiritual realm. That is, his resurrection was unlike any other resurrections, the accounts of which we have in the Bible. Lazarus, for instance, raised from the dead after having been dead for four days. He was raised from the dead in the physical realm. He came out from the tomb they unwrapped him and set him free. He lived out the rest of his life. He died again. Jairus' daughter, remember that account? Jesus raised her from the dead in the physical realm. Gave her back to her parents. She lived out a life, presumably. Died again. They're raised in the physical realm. But Jesus, put to death in the flesh, raised in the spiritual realm, he came out from the tomb. Granted, he had a body, but it was a resurrected body. He bid his disciples, reach out your hand, touch the wounds in my hand and in my side. See, here a spirit doesn't have a body. He had a body, but his body was a resurrected body. It was totally suited in the spiritual realm. And Paul talks all about that in 1 Corinthians 15, about us and our resurrected bodies. He concludes that entire argument right there with um, the final line where he says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. The corruptible can't inherit the incorruptible. So when we're raised from the dead, we will be raised from the dead with bodies, but they'll be unique, entirely suited for that realm, the spiritual realm. So we have here a contrast between these two realms. It says that he is in the flesh, put to death, in the spirit, made alive. So he died as a man in his humanity on the cross. They could kill him. They did kill him. But he was made alive by the Spirit in the spiritual realm. If you have a King James Version, it says quickened by the Spirit with an uppercase S, the Holy Spirit. If you have a New American Standard like I'm reading from here or an English Standard Bible, those versions say in the Spirit with a lowercase s, meaning more in, in the realm of the Spirit. And as I understand it, the, the word supports either interpretation, either translation, and it doesn't make much difference. 
in the context here, but it's important for understanding what follows. He was raised in the realm of the Spirit by the Holy Spirit. Now, we enter into verse 19 and 20, and these are the difficult to understand exactly what they mean, these verses, but the part, the last part of verse 18 is key, this realm that he was raised in, in the spiritual realm. So if we're to understand this portion, there are questions to be answered. Now, in my Bible, for a long time, I've had a question mark in the margin. At the end of verse 18, what does that mean? Made alive in the Spirit. And I've got a question mark. Verse 19, what does all that mean? Hoping someday to come back to try and figure it out, and I've had that opportunity now in the last two weeks to try. And so, here, if we're to understand this portion, there are some questions to be answered. One, who are the spirits in prison? What does that mean? I mean, unbelievers who have died, or Old Testament believers who have died, or fallen angels, all of these three, some people believe, are the spirits in prison. Another question, what did Christ preach? It says he made a proclamation. What did he preach? Did he preach a second chance for repentance? Some people believe that. Did he preach his victory over death? Others believe that. Did he preach a final condemnation? to these spirits who are now in prison. Have you ever thought about any of this stuff? <laughs> maybe this has been, maybe this portion has been a question mark in your Bible for all the years that you've been a believer. Another question, when did he preach? Did he preach in the days of Noah? Or did he preach between his death and his resurrection, those Three days right there? Or did he preach after his resurrection? These are questions that I suppose if we're to understand this portion, we've got to answer them. Well, three interpretations. I, I've narrowed it down to three. Um, I'm going to give them to you, not in too much detail, because I don't believe in talking too much about maybe um, things that would confuse us all the more. I hope I don't do that. But there are three basic interpretations that are really prevalent anyway, um, aside from a few little alterations in them. One of the interpretations is this. After Christ died and before he rose again, those three days, he went and preached to people who are in hell, offering them a second chance of salvation. The proclamation, the word that is in my Bible in verse 19, proclamation, that word is used almost entirely in the New Testament, meaning preaching the gospel, the good news. So there are those who say he went between his death and resurrection to hell, people that are in hell, and preached the gospel to them, offering a second chance at salvation to the rebellious generation of the flood. People believe that. Some include fallen angels as well as these. Another version, the Catholic version, says after Christ died, he proclaimed release to people who had repented just before they died in the flood. And he led them out of their imprisonment. And to them, to the Catholics, imprisonment is purgatory. It's limbo. And Christ went and delivered them from limbo, from purgatory. That's another interpretation. Then there are those who say between the time of his death 
and his resurrection, Christ went into hell and made a proclamation of victory, of triumph, a triumphal announcement to demonic spirits that are there, presently imprisoned there, declaring to them that their judgment was final. Um, Among prevalent evangelicals, John MacArthur believes this way. He says, the demons may have been celebrating their seeming victory in the wake of Christ's death and burial, but only to soon be profoundly and permanently disappointed when the living Christ himself arrived. That's John MacArthur's take on it. And I suppose there is some um, some scriptural validity, at least something that might lead you to think that way. Jude talks about angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned the proper abode. He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And Peter himself said God did not spare angels when they sinned but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness. That kind of sounds like prison terminology. Um, Some understand these spirits to be fallen angels, the ones that are talked about in Genesis 6, verse 1 through 3, the sons of God, they're called right there, who took wives of the daughters of men and produced the Nephilim. That's another mysterious portion that different people interpret different ways. But they say that these are those fallen angels in prison, Down there, when Christ died between his death and his resurrection, he went down and proclaimed his victory and triumph over them and sealed their doom. The Apostles' Creed, which is generally a very good creed as far as creeds go to live by, says Christ, quote, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell The third day he rose again from the dead. That's a portion out of the Apostles' Creed. But as I understand that portion right there, he descended into hell, was not in the original Apostles' Creed, but it was added centuries later. But nonetheless, it's in there. I don't know what we would do if we held that If we held that view, what would we do with verses where Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise, as he was dying to the thief? Or what would we do with the verse that says, it is finished? There's nothing more to do. Why would Christ descend into hell if that was required yet? And he said, into your hands I commit my spirit, when he gave up the ghost. I mean, those are verses that seem... Uh, to contradict this idea of Christ ascending into hell during that three-day period. So here's what, what I think, what seems to be believable in my mind. The spirits in prison. One, the word spirits right there, it could refer to human spirits or angelic spirits. It could be either in the, in the original text um, mostly the, the understanding of it um, is determined by the context, generally. So it could be either. But verse 20 gives us some light on all of this. Verse 20 gives us some details about these spirits in prison. One, it says, they once were disobedient. Formerly, they were disobedient spirits. And also it gives us a time when the patience of God kept waiting. So those are a couple of clues when we're asking the question, who are these spirits? Well, we know that it was human disobedience and wickedness that prompted God to destroy the world with the flood. And never in the Bible is there ever a chance given, a second chance given for angels to repent. 
In fact, it's just the opposite. Hebrews 2 says, Assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. And I quoted 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, God did not spare the angels when they sinned. He cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness. But with mankind, there's grace. With you today, there's mercy. There's a chance to repent as long as you're alive. You can be reconciled with God. I just talked about that for the first 20 minutes of the sermon. That's you and I. Toward us, God has love. And we ought to be very grateful that when we sin, we're not immediately cast into hell. God said in Genesis 6, in verse 3, which is the context of all of this, He said, My spirit will not always strive with man forever because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. In other words, he's got a body. He's going to die. My spirit will not always strive with man. His days shall be 120 years. That's Some people say, well, that means the lifespan of man as a result of this sin and this curse is only going to be 120 years. That's an interpretation of that. I don't believe that's true because it didn't prove to be true. From that point on, many people lived beyond 120 years in the Old Testament. Granted, the lifespan began to be diminished as a result of sin, but Abraham himself lived longer than that. Sarah, all of the patriarchs, Jacob, Isaac. So it couldn't be that. So I think it's 120 years of patience with mankind while he was waiting before their judgment was final. It says in verse 5 of Genesis 6, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So I believe God was patiently waiting for the construction of the ark to be completed before he sent the final judgment, the flood, destroyed them all. He was patiently waiting. We're told also here in our first Peter text, the spirits are now in prison. That is now at the time that Peter was writing the letter. He was writing about spirits that are now in prison but they were people that were living on the earth at the time when Christ was preaching to them. They were alive then, but now while Peter's writing this, they're in prison. They were alive in the days of Noah. So the Spirit of Christ, He was made alive in the Spirit, and in which also, that is, in the spiritual realm, He went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Now, we know the Spirit of Christ was active in the Old Testament. Early on in this very letter, in chapter 1 and verse 11, Peter was talking about the prophets. They were seeking to know what time, what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating. So here are prophets. They're prophesying things they don't understand. The Spirit of Christ is within them prophesying. So we know the Spirit of Christ was active in the Old Testament. Paul was telling the Corinthian church in the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10 and verse 4, he was speaking about the spiritual rock that was following the nation as they traversed toward the promised land. That spiritual rock, he said, was Christ that they drank out of. So here's Christ represented in the Old Testament as active before he ever was incarnated in the flesh, brought to the cross and crucified in the flesh. And we also know that Noah, according to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, 
He was a preacher of righteousness, Peter says. So here, I believe, is the summary and the way to understand, way to understand this as best as we can. Christ did not stay in heaven, but he went in the Spirit to earth to preach through Noah to people who were alive then, but now their spirits imprisoned in hell, having been destroyed by the judgment of God in the flood, when his patience at last was withdrawn. And the preaching of Christ through Noah was a message just like it is now. Repent. Repent. Don't perish. Repent. While the ark was being constructed and the merciful patience of God was being extended toward the human race for approximately 120 years, So what are we to take from it? Well, we're to take this. God is patient. He's patiently waiting, even today. Whenever, if Lord willing, we make our way into 2 Peter, we'll come across that portion at the very end where Peter Peter draws a comparison. It's not a flood to destroy the world that's coming. It's a flame. Peter says there, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but what? He's patient toward you. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and all its works will be burned up. So it's not a flood coming to destroy while God waited patiently and Noah preached under the Spirit of Christ. But it's a fire. The earth will be destroyed in all of its works. And God is patiently waiting now for that to happen. And the gospel is going out just like it is this morning. The same way, preaching repentance, preaching Christ, believe in Christ. And the The Lord is not slow, He's not not lagging behind to fulfill His promise. He's being patient. And Paul warns us, as he did the Romans in chapter 2 and verse 4, not to take lightly the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience. Don't you know, he says, the patience, the kindness of God is leading you to repentance. You see, that's what's going on right now just like it was in Noah's day. But he goes on to tell the Romans, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when it all comes down. And the judgment, the righteous judgment of God is revealed. So as with the flood in Noah's day, The final judgment will eventually come on our world and relatively few will escape. In Noah's day, it was eight people. They were brought into the ark. But God will save all of those who are as Noah in that ark. Christ was typified in that ark. Enter into Christ. Escape the judgment to come. That's all there is. He's the once for all sacrifice. There's none other. We've got to believe in Him as that sacrifice and enter into the ark. That's all the, that's the image there. On that very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and three wives of, of his sons with them entered into the ark. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God has commanded them, and the Lord closed it behind them. They were secured. It's interesting that Peter affirms the Old Testament account of Noah as Jesus does. There are some that want to discredit all that. Well, that's a good story. You know, the, the little creatures, male and female, marching up the, 
gangplank and Noah standing there and that, what a good story that is to tell little kids. But it's a reality. It's God sparing those from His judgment, His own judgment, His own brand of justice. And Peter affirms that account of Noah right here, and Jesus Himself did, emphasizing human disregard and impending judgment. Jesus said in Luke 17, just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man when he returns to earth and everything is end, ended, finalized. Jesus said they were eating and were drinking and were marrying and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus said it's the same disregard that's so prevalent in the world today. And the end will be the same. The impending judgment will come. Hebrews 11, 7. Hebrews 11 is that faith, great faith chapter, you know, gives all those Old Testament characters and what they did by faith, the power of faith, and, and, and by faith. Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. He made it. And so that's how this portion fits, as near as I can understand it. Peter's preaching to some that are suffering undeservedly. He puts Christ forward as the ultimate example of one who suffered undeservingly, but who became the sacrifice just for the unjust with the intent, the mission to rescue all sinners that would repent, believe on him, and save them just like those that entered into the ark were saved in the day when God patiently waited and Christ preached through Noah to the fallen world of mankind who then subsequently were destroyed in the flood and now are spirits imprisoned. I think that's how we understand it, as near as I can tell. So my message to you today is, how do you view Jesus? He's the sacrifice. He's the ark. Believe on Him, enter in, escape the judgment. He came to rescue sinners. For that I rejoice in. There was no other way. He said, not your will, but mine be done. Put to death in the flesh, made alive in the Spirit.